chapter three of recollections and letters of general robert e lee by robert e lee jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three letters to wife and daughters from camp on sewell's mountain quotation from colonel taylor's book from professor william p trent from mr davis's memorial address defense of southern ports christmas eighteen sixty one the general visits his father's grave commands under the president all the armies of the confederate states the season being too far advanced to attempt any further movements away from our base of supplies and the same reasons preventing any advance of the federal forces the campaign in this part of virginia ended for the winter in the kanawha valley however the enemy had been and were quite active large reinforcements under general rosecrans were sent there to assist general cox the officer in command at that point general loring leaving a sufficient force to watch the enemy at cheat mountain moved the rest of his army to join the commands of generals floyd and wise who were opposing the advance of cox general lee about september twentieth reached general floyd's camp and immediately proceeded to arrange the lines of defence shortly after his arrival there he wrote to my mother at the hot springs camp at sewell's mountain september twenty sixth eighteen sixty one i have just received dear mary your letters of the seventeenth and nineteenth instants with one from robert i have but little time for writing to-night and will therefore write to you having now disposed of business matters i will say how glad i am to hear from you and to learn that you have reached the hot in safety with daughter and rob i pray that its healing waters may benefit you all i am glad to hear of charlotte and the girls and hope all will go well with them i infer you received my letter written before leaving valley mountain though you did not direct your letter via lewisburg greenbrier county and hence its delay i told you of the death of colonel washington i grieve for his loss though trust him to the mercy of our heavenly father may he have mercy on us all it is raining heavily the men are all exposed on the mountain with the enemy opposite to us we are without tents and for two nights i have lain buttoned up in my overcoat to-day my tent came up and i am in it yet i fear i shall not sleep for thinking of the poor men i wrote about socks for myself i have no doubt the yarn ones you mention will be very acceptable to the men here or elsewhere if you can send them here i will distribute them to the most needy tell rob i could not write to him for want of time my heart is always with you and my children may god guard and bless you all is the constant prayer of your devoted husband r e lee to my mother still at the hot springs sewell's mountain october seventh eighteen sixty one i have received dear mary your letter by dr quintard with the cotton socks both were very acceptable though the latter i have not yet tried at the time of their reception the enemy was threatening an attack which was continued till saturday night when under cover of darkness he suddenly withdrew your letter of the second with the yarn socks four pairs was handed to me when i was preparing to follow and i could not at the time attend to either but i have since and as i found perry in desperate need i bestowed a couple of pairs on him as a present from you the others i have put in my trunk and suppose they will fall to the lot of meredith footnote his cook a servant from the white house End note. into the state of whose hose i have not yet inquired should any sick man require them first he shall have them but meredith will have no one near to supply him but me and will naturally expect that attention i hope dear mary you and daughter as well as poor little rob have derived some benefit from the sanitary baths of the hot what does daughter intend to do during the winter and indeed what do you it is time you were determining there is no prospect of your returning to arlington i think you had better select some comfortable place in the carolinas or georgia and all board together if mildred goes to school at raleigh why not there it is a good opportunity to try a warmer climate for your rheumatism if i thought our enemies would not make a vigorous move against richmond i would recommend to rent a house there but under these circumstances i would not feel as if you were permanently located if there 
i am ignorant where i shall be in the field somewhere i suspect so i have little hope of being with you though i hope to be able to see you i heard from fitzhugh the other day he is well though his command is greatly reduced by sickness i wished much to bring him with me but there is too much cavalry on this line now and i am dismounting them i could not therefore order more the weather is almost as bad here as in the mountains i left there was a drenching rain yesterday and as i had left my overcoat in camp i was thoroughly wet from head to foot it has been raining ever since and is now coming down with a will but i have my clothes out on the bushes and they will be well washed the force of the enemy by a few prisoners captured yesterday and civilians on the road is put down from seventeen thousand to twenty thousand some went as high as twenty two thousand general floyd thinks eighteen thousand i do not think it exceeds nine thousand or ten thousand though it exceeds ours i wish he had attacked us as i believe he would have been repulsed with great loss his plan was to attack us at all points at the same time the rumbling of his wheels etc was heard by our pickets but as that was customary at night in the moving and placing of his cannon the officer of the day to whom it was reported paid no particular attention to it supposing it to be a preparation for attack in the morning when day appeared the bird had flown and the misfortune was that the reduced condition of our horses for want of provender exposure to cold rains in these mountains and want of provisions for the men prevented the vigorous pursuit and following up that was proper we can only get up provisions from day to day which paralyzes our operations i am sorry as you say that the movements of the armies cannot keep pace with the expectations of the editors of papers i know they can regulate matters satisfactorily to themselves on paper i wish they could do so in the field no one wishes them more success than i do and would be happy to see them have full swing i hope something will be done to please them give much love to the children and everybody and believe me always yours r e lee colonel taylor in his four years with general lee says we had now reached the latter days of october the lateness of the season and the condition of the roads precluded the idea of earnest aggressive operations and the campaign in western virginia was virtually concluded judged from its results it must be confessed that this series of operations was a failure at its conclusion a large portion of the state was in possession of the federals including the rich valleys of the ohio and kanawha rivers and so remained until the close of the war for this however general lee cannot reasonably be held accountable disaster had befallen the confederate arms and the worst had been accomplished before he had reached the theatre of operations the alleghanies there constituted the dividing line between the hostile forces and in this network of mountains sterile and rendered absolutely impractical by a prolonged season of rain nature had provided an insurmountable barrier to operations in this transmontane country it was doubtless because of similar embarrassments that the federal general retired in the face of inferior numbers to a point near his base of supplies professor william p trent in his robert e lee after describing briefly the movements of the contending armies writes there was then nothing to do but to acknowledge the campaign a failure the confederate government withdrew its troops and sent them elsewhere lee whom the press abused and even former friends began to regard as overrated was assigned to command the department of south carolina georgia and florida and her western counties were lost to the old dominion forever it must have been a crushing blow to lee at the time but he bore it uncomplainingly and when all is said no commander however great can succeed against bad roads bad weather sickness of troops lack of judgment and harmony among subordinates and a strong alert enemy yet this is what lee was expected to do mr davis in an address before a memorial meeting at richmond in eighteen seventy speaking of general lee in this campaign said he came back carrying the heavy weight of defeat and unappreciated by the people whom he served for they could not know as i knew that if his plans and orders had been carried out the result would have been victory rather than retreat 
you did not know it for i should not have known it had he not breathed it in my ear only at my earnest request and begging that nothing be said about it the clamour which then arose followed him when he went to south carolina so that it became necessary on his departure to write a letter to the governor of that state telling him what manner of man he was yet through all this with a magnanimity rarely equalled he stood in silence without defending himself or allowing others to defend him for he was unwilling to offend any one who was wearing a sword and striking blows for the confederacy after returning to richmond my father resumed his position as adviser and counsellor to mr davis from there he writes to my mother who had left the hot springs and gone on a visit to shirley on james river richmond november fifth eighteen sixty one my dear mary i received last night your letter of the second and would have answered it at once but was detained with the secretary till after eleven p m i fear now i may miss the mail saturday evening i tried to get down to you to spend sunday but could find no government boat going down and the passenger boats all go in the morning i then went to the stable and got out my horse but it was near night then and i was ignorant both of the road and distance and i gave it up i was obliged to be here monday and as it would have consumed all sunday to go and come i have remained for better times the president said i could not go to-day so i must see what can be done to-morrow i will come however wherever you are either shirley or the white house as soon as possible and if not sooner saturday at all events i am as ever yours r e lee the day after this letter was written my father was ordered to south carolina for the purpose of directing and supervising the construction of a line of defence along the southern coast i give here several letters to members of his family which tell of his duties and manner of life savannah november eighteenth eighteen sixty one my dear mary this is the first moment i have had to write to you and now am waiting the call to breakfast on my way to brunswick ferrandina etc this is my second visit to savannah night before last i returned to kusawachi south carolina from charleston where i have placed my headquarters and last night came here arriving after midnight i received in charleston your letter from shirley it was a grievous disappointment to me not to have seen you but better times will come i hope you probably have seen the operations of the enemy's fleet since their first attack they have been quiescent apparently confining themselves to hilton head where they are apparently fortifying i have no time for more love to all yours very affectionately and truly r e lee charleston november fifteenth eighteen sixty one my precious daughter i have received your letter forwarded to richmond by mr powell and i also got while in the west the letter sent by b turner i can write but seldom but your letters always give me great pleasure i am glad you had such a pleasant visit to kinlock i have passed a great many pleasant days there myself in my young days now you must labour at your books and gain knowledge and wisdom do not mind what rob says i have a beautiful white beard it is much admired at least much remarked on you know i have told you not to believe what the young men tell you i was unable to see your poor mother when in richmond before i could get down i was sent off here another forlorn hope expedition worse than west virginia i have much to do in this country i have been to savannah and have to go again the enemy is quiet after his conquest of port royal harbor and his whole fleet is lying there may god guard and protect you my dear child always your affectionate father r e lee the above letter was written to his youngest daughter mildred who was at school in winchester virginia two of my sisters were in king george county virginia at clydale the summer home of dr richard stewart with whose family we had been a long time intimate from there they had driven to stratford in westmoreland county about thirty miles distant where my father was born they had written him of this trip and this is his reply savannah november twenty second eighteen sixty one my darling daughters i have just received your joint letter of october twenty fourth from clydale it was very cheering to me and the affection and sympathy you expressed were very grateful to my feelings i wish indeed i could see you be with you and never again part from you 
god only can give me that happiness i pray for it night and day but my prayers i know are not worthy to be heard i received your former letter in western virginia but had no opportunity to reply to it i enjoyed it nevertheless i am glad you do not wait to hear from me as that would deprive me of the pleasure of hearing from you often i am so pressed with business i am much pleased at your description of stratford and your visit it is endeared to me by many recollections and it has been always a great desire of my life to be able to purchase it now that we have no other home and the one we so loved has been so foully polluted the desire is stronger with me than ever the horse-chestnut you mention in the garden was planted by my mother i am sorry the vault is so dilapidated you did not mention the spring one of the objects of my earliest recollections i am very glad my precious agnes that you have become so early a riser it is a good habit and in these times for mighty works advantage should be taken of every hour i much regretted being obliged to come from richmond without seeing your poor mother this is my second visit to savannah i have been down the coast to amelia island to examine the defences they are poor indeed and i have laid off work enough to employ our people a month i hope our enemy will be polite enough to wait for us it is difficult to get our people to realize their position good-bye my dear daughters your affectionate father r e lee to his daughter annie coosawhatchee south carolina december eighth eighteen sixty one my precious annie i have taken the only quiet time i have been able to find on this holy day to thank you for your letter of the twenty ninth alto one of the miseries of war is that there is no sabbath and the current of work and strife has no cessation how can we be pardoned for all our offences i am glad that you have joined your mamma again and that some of you are together at last it would be a great happiness to me were you all at some quiet place remote from the vicissitudes of war where i could consider you safe you must have had a pleasant time at clydale i hope indeed that cedar grove may be saved from the ruin and pillage that other places have received at the hands of our enemies who are pursuing the same course here as they have practised elsewhere unfortunately too the numerous deep estuaries all accessible to their ships expose the multitude of islands to their predatory excursions and what they leave is finished by the negroes whose masters have deserted their plantations subject to visitations of the enemy i am afraid cousin julia footnote dr and mrs richard stewart End note, will not be able to defend her home if attacked by the vandals for they have little respect for anybody and if they catch the doctor they will certainly send him to fort warren or lafayette i fear too the yankees will bear off their pretty daughters i am very glad you visited chatham footnote the home of the fitzhughes where my grandmother custis was born End note i was there many years ago when it was the residence of judge coulter and some of the avenues of poplar so dear to your grandmamma still existed i presume they have all gone now the letter that you and agnes wrote from clydale i replied to and sent to that place you know i never have any news i am trying to get a force to make headway on our defences but it comes in very slow the people do not seem to realize that there is a war it is very warm here if that is news and as an evidence i enclose some violets i plucked in the yard of a deserted house i occupy i wish i could see you and give them in person good-bye my precious child give much love to everybody and believe me your affectionate father r e lee from the same place on december second he writes to my mother i received last night dear mary your letter of the twelfth and am delighted to learn that you are all well and so many of you are together i am much pleased that fitzhugh has an opportunity to be with you all and will not be so far removed from his home in his new field of action i hope to see him at the head of a fine regiment and that he will be able to do good service in the cause of his country if mary and rob get to you christmas you will have quite a family party especially if fitzhugh is not obliged to leave his home and sweet wife before that time 
i shall think of you all on that holy day more intensely than usual and i shall pray to the great god of heaven to shower his blessings upon you in this world and to unite you all in his courts in the world to come with a grateful heart i thank him for his preservation thus far and trust to his mercy and kindness for the future oh that i were more worthy more thankful for all he has done and continues to do for me perry and meredith footnote his two colored servants end note send their respects to all truly and affectionately r e lee from the same place on christmas day he writes to my mother i cannot let this day of grateful rejoicing pass dear mary without some communication with you i am thankful for the many among the past that i have passed with you and the remembrance of them fills me with pleasure for those on which we have been separated we must not repine if it will make us more resigned and better prepared for what is in store for us we should rejoice now we must be content with the many blessings we receive if we can only become sensible of our transgressions so as to be fully penitent and forgiven that this heavy punishment under which we labour may with justice be removed from us and the whole nation what a gracious consummation of all that we have endured it will be i hope you had a pleasant visit to richmond if you were to see this place i think you would have it too i am here but little myself the days i am not here i visit some point exposed to the enemy and after our dinner at early candlelight am engaged in writing till eleven or twelve o'clock at night as to our old home if not destroyed it will be difficult ever to be recognized even if the enemy had wished to preserve it it would almost have been impossible with the number of troops encamped around it the change of officers etc the want of fuel shelter etc and all the dire necessities of war it is vain to think of its being in a habitable condition i fear too books furniture and the relics of mount vernon will be gone it is better to make up our minds to a general loss they cannot take away the remembrance of the spot and the memories of those that to us rendered it sacred that will remain to us as long as life will last and that we can preserve in the absence of a home i wish i could purchase stratford that is the only other place that i could go to now accessible to us that would inspire me with feelings of pleasure and local love you and the girls could remain there in quiet it is a poor place but we could make enough corn-bread and bacon for our support and the girls could weave us clothes i wonder if it is for sale and at how much ask fitzhugh to try to find out when he gets to fredericksburg you must not build your hopes on peace on account of the united states going into a war with england footnote on account of the trent affair end note she will be very loath to do that notwithstanding the bluster of the northern papers her rulers are not entirely mad and if they find england is in earnest and that war or a restitution of their captives must be the consequence they will adopt the latter we must make up our minds to fight our battles and win our independence alone no one will help us we require no extraneous aid if true to ourselves but we must be patient it is not a light achievement and cannot be accomplished at once i wrote a few days since giving you all the news and have now therefore nothing to relate the enemy is still quiet and increasing in strength we grow in size slowly but are working hard i have had a day of labor instead of rest and have written at intervals to some of the children i hope they are with you and enclose my letters affectionately and truly r e lee in the next letter to my mother he describes a visit to the grave of his father at dungeness on cumberland island georgia dungeness was presented to general nathaniel green by the state of georgia for services rendered her in the revolution general henry lee returning from the west indies where he had been for some months on account of his health landed there and in a few days died march fifteenth eighteen eighteen he was most kindly cared for by the daughter of his old commander and was buried there in the garden of dungeness at the time of my father's visit the place belonged to a great nephew of general green mr nightingale Cusawatchie, south carolina january eighteenth eighteen sixty two on my return day before yesterday from florida dear mary i received your letter of the first instant 
i am very glad to find that you had a pleasant family meeting christmas and that it was so large i am truly grateful for all the mercies we enjoy notwithstanding the miseries of war and join heartily in the wish that the next year may find us at peace with all the world i am delighted to hear that our little grandson footnote his first grandchild son of my brother fitzhugh he died in eighteen sixty three end note is improving so fast and is becoming such a perfect gentleman may his path be strewn with flowers and his life with happiness i am very glad to hear also that his dear papa is promoted it will be gratifying to him and increase i hope his means of usefulness robert wrote me he saw him on his way through charlottesville with his squadron and that he was well while at fernandina i went over to cumberland island and walked up to dungeness the former residence of general green it was my first visit to the house and i had the gratification at length of visiting my father's grave he died there you may recollect on his way from the west indies and was interred in one corner of the family cemetery the spot is marked by a plain marble slab with his name age and date of his death mrs green is also buried there and her daughter mrs shaw and her husband the place is at present owned by mr nightingale nephew of mrs shaw who married a daughter of mr james king the family have moved into the interior of georgia leaving only a few servants and a white gardener on the place the garden was beautiful enclosed by the finest hedge i have ever seen it was of the wild olive the orange trees were small and the orange grove which in mrs shaw's lifetime during my tour of duty in savannah in early life was so productive had been destroyed by an insect that has proved fatal to the orange on the coast of georgia and florida there was a fine grove of olives from which i learn mr nightingale procures oil the garden was filled with roses and beautiful vines the names of which i do not know among them was the tomato vine in full bearing with the ripe fruit on it there has yet been no frost in that region of country this winter i went in the dining-room and parlour in which the furniture still remained the house has never been finished but is a fine large one and beautifully located a magnificent grove of live oaks envelops the road from the landing to the house love to everybody and god bless you all truly and faithfully yours r e lee from the same place there is another letter to my mother kusawachi south carolina january twenty eighth eighteen sixty two i have just returned from charleston and received your letter of the fourteenth dear mary i was called to charleston by the appearance off the bar of a fleet of vessels the true character and intent of which could not be discerned during the continuance of the storm which obscured the view saturday however all doubt was dispelled and from the beach on sullivan's island the preparations for sinking them were plainly seen twenty-one were visible the first day of my arrival but at the end of the storm saturday only seventeen were seen five of these were vessels of war what became of the other four is not known the twelve old merchantmen were being stripped of their spars masts etc and by sunset seven were prepared apparently for sinking across the mouth of the maffet channel they were placed in a line about two hundred yards apart about four miles from fort moultrie they will do but little harm to the channel i think but may deter vessels from running out at night for fear of getting on them there now seem to be indications of a movement against savannah the enemy's gunboats are pushing up the creek to cut off communication between the city and fort pulaski on cockspur island unless i have better news i must go there to-day there are so many points of attack and so little means to meet them on water that there is but little rest perry and meredith are well and send regards to everybody very truly and sincerely yours r e lee it was most important that the defences of charleston and savannah should be made as strong as possible the difficulties in the way were many and great but general lee's perseverance overcame most of them the result was that neither of those cities fell till the close of the war and a region of country was preserved to the confederacy necessary for the feeding of its armies of course all of this was not accomplished by my father alone in the four months he was there but the plans of defence he laid down were successfully followed 
while in savannah he writes to my mother savannah february eighth eighteen sixty two i write to you dear mary the day i left kusawachi for this place i have been here ever since endeavouring to push forward the work for the defence of the city which has lagged terribly and which ought to have been finished but it is difficult to arouse ourselves from ease and comfort to labour and self-denial guns are scarce as well as ammunition and i shall have to break up batteries on the coast to provide i fear for this city our enemies are endeavouring to work their way through the creeks that traverse the impassable and soft marshes stretching along the interior of the coast and communicating with the sounds and sea through which the savannah flows and thus avoid the entrance of the river commanded by fort pulaski their boats require only seven feet of water to float them and the tide rises seven feet so that at high water they can work their way and rest on the mud at low they are also provided with dredges and appliances for removing obstructions through the creeks in question which cannot be guarded by batteries i hope however we shall be able to stop them and i daily pray to the giver of all victories to enable us to do so i trust you are all well and doing well and wish i could do anything to promote either i have more here than i can do and more i fear than i can well accomplish it is so very hard to get anything done and while all wish well and mean well it is so different to get them to act energetically and promptly the news from kentucky and tennessee is not favourable but we must make up our minds to meet with reverses and overcome them i hope god will at last crown our efforts with success but the contest must be long and severe and the whole country has to go through much suffering it is necessary we should be humbled and taught to be less boastful less selfish and more devoted to right and justice to all the world always yours r e lee to my mother savannah february twenty third eighteen sixty two i have been wishing dear mary to write to you for more than a week but every day and every hour seems so taken up that i have found it impossible the news from tennessee and north carolina is not all cheering and disasters seem to be thickening around us it calls for renewed energies and redoubled strength on our part and i hope will produce it i fear our soldiers have not realized the necessity for the endurance and labor they are called upon to undergo and that it is better to sacrifice themselves than our cause god i hope will shield us and give us success here the enemy is progressing slowly in his designs and does not seem prepared or to have determined when or where to make his attack his gunboats are pushing up all the creeks and marshes of the savannah and have attained a position so near the river as to shell the steamers navigating it none have as yet been struck i am engaged in constructing a line of defence at fort jackson which if time permits and guns can be obtained i hope will keep them out they can bring such overwhelming force in all their movements that it has the effect to demoralize our new troops the accounts given in the papers of the quantity of cotton shipped to new york are of course exaggerated it is cotton in the seed and dirt and has to be ginned and cleaned after its arrival it is said that the negroes are employed in picking and collecting it and are paid a certain amount but all these things are gathered from rumour and can only be believed as they appear probable which this seems to be i went yesterday to church being the day appointed for fasting and prayer i wish i could have passed it more devoutly the bishop uh, elliot gave a most beautiful prayer for the president which i hope may be heard and answered here the yellow jasmine red bud orange trees etc perfume the whole woods and the japonicas and azaleas cover the garden perry and meredith are well may god bless and keep you always is the constant prayer of your husband r e lee to his daughter annie savannah march second eighteen sixty two my precious annie it has been a long time since i have written to you but you have been constantly in my thoughts i think of you all separately and collectively in the busy hours of the day and the silent hours of the night and the recollection of each and every one whiles away the long night in which my anxious thoughts drive away sleep 
but i always feel that you and agnes at those times are sound asleep and that it is immaterial to either where the blockaders are or what their progress is in the river i hope you are all well and as happy as you can be in these perilous times to our country they look dark at present and it is plain we have not suffered enough laboured enough repented enough to deserve success but they will brighten after a while and i trust that a merciful god will arouse us to a sense of our danger bless our honest efforts and drive back our enemies to their homes our people have not been earnest enough have thought too much of themselves and their ease and instead of turning out to a man have been content to nurse themselves and their dimes and leave the protection of themselves and families to others to satisfy their consciences they have been clamorous in criticizing what others have done and endeavored to prove that they ought to do nothing this is not the way to accomplish our independence i have been doing all i can with our small means and slow workmen to defend the cities and coast here against ordinary numbers we are pretty strong but against the hosts our enemies seem able to bring everywhere there is no calculating but if our men will stand to their work we shall give them trouble and damage them yet they have worked their way across the marshes with their dredges under cover of their gunboats to the savannah river about fort pulaski i presume they will endeavor to reduce the fort and thus open a way for their vessels up the river but we have an interior line they must force before reaching the city it is on this line we are working slowly to my anxious mind but as fast as i can drive them good-bye my dear child may god bless you and our poor country your devoted father r e lee soon after this letter was written my father was recalled to richmond and was assigned on the thirteenth of march under the direction of the president to the conduct of the military operations of all the armies of the confederate states footnote four years with general lee End note my mother was still at the white house my brother's place on the pamunkey and there my father wrote to her richmond march fourteenth eighteen sixty two my dear mary i have been trying all the week to write to you but have not been able i have been placed on duty here to conduct operations under the direction of the president it will give me great pleasure to do anything i can to relieve him and serve the country but i do not see either advantage or pleasure in my duties but i will not complain but do my best i do not see at present either that it will enable me to see much more of you in the present condition of affairs no one can foresee what may happen nor in my judgment is it advisable for any one to make arrangements with a view to permanency or pleasure we must all do what promises the most usefulness the presence of some one at the white house is necessary as long as practicable how long it will be practicable for you and charlotte to remain there i cannot say the enemy is pushing us back in all directions and how far he will be successful depends much upon our efforts and the mercy of providence i shall in all human probability soon have to take the field so for the present i think things had better remain as they are write me your views if you think it best for you to come to richmond i can soon make arrangements for your comfort and shall be very glad of your company and presence we have experienced a great affliction both in our private and public relations our good and noble bishop meade died last night he was very anxious to see you sent you his love and kindest remembrances and had i known in time yesterday i should have sent expressly for you to come up but i did not know of his wish or condition till after the departure of the cars yesterday between six and seven p m yesterday he sent for me said he wished to bid me good-bye and to give me his blessing which he did in the most affecting manner called me robert and reverted to the time i used to say the catechism to him he invoked the blessing of god upon me and the country he spoke with difficulty and pain but was perfectly calm and clear his hand was then cold and pulseless yet he shook mine warmly i ne'er shall look upon his like again he died during the night i presume the papers of to-morrow will tell you all very truly and sincerely r e lee the next day he again writes to my mother richmond march fifteenth eighteen sixty two 
my dear mary i wrote you yesterday by mail on returning to my quarters last night after eleven p m custis informed me robert had arrived and had made up his mind to go into the army he stayed at the spotswood and this morning i went with him to get his overcoat blankets etc there is great difficulty in procuring what is good they all have to be made and he has gone to the office of the adjutant-general of virginia to engage in the service god grant it may be for his good as he has permitted it i must be resigned i told him of the exemption granted by the secretary of war to the professors and students of the university but he expressed no desire to take advantage of it it would be useless for him to go if he did not improve himself nor would i wish him to go merely for exemption as i have done all in the matter that seems proper and right i must now leave the rest in the hands of our merciful god i hope our son will do his duty and make a good soldier i had expected yesterday to go to north carolina this morning but the president changed his mind i should like to go to see you to-morrow but in the present condition of things do not feel that i ought to be absent i may have to go to north carolina or norfolk yet new Bern, north carolina has fallen into the hands of the enemy in arkansas our troops under van dorn have had a hard battle but nothing decisive gained four generals killed mcintosh mccullough herbert and slack general price wounded loss on both sides said to be heavy very truly yours r e lee End of chapter three chapter four of recollections and letters of general robert e lee by robert e lee jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four army life of robert the younger a volunteer in rockridge artillery four years with general lee quoted meetings between father and son personal characteristics of the general death of his daughter annie his son robert raised from the ranks the horses grace darling and traveller fredericksburg freeing slaves like all the students at the university i was wild to go into the army and wrote my father that i was afraid the war would be over before i had a chance to serve his reply was that i need have no fear of that contingency that i must study hard and fit myself to be useful to my country when i was old enough to be of real service to her so very properly i was not allowed to have my wish then in a letter to my mother written april sixty one he says i wrote to robert that i could not consent to take boys from their schools and young men from their colleges and put them in the ranks at the beginning of a war when they are not wanted and when there were men enough for that purpose the war may last ten years where are our ranks to be filled from then i was willing for his company to continue at their studies to keep up its organization and to perfect themselves in their military exercises and to perform duty at the college but not to be called into the field i therefore wished him to remain if the exercises at the college are suspended he can then come home but in the spring of sixty two he allowed me to volunteer and i having selected the company i wished to join the rock ridge artillery he gave his approval and wrote me to come to richmond where he would give me my outfit he was just as sweet and loving to me then as in the old days i had seen so little of him during the last six years that i stood somewhat in awe of him i soon found however that i had no cause for such a feeling he took great pains in getting what was necessary for me the baggage of a private in a confederate battery was not extensive how little was needed my father even at that time did not know for though he was very careful in providing me with the least amount he thought necessary i soon found by experience that he had given me a great deal too much it was characteristic of his consideration for others and the unselfishness of his nature that at this time when weighed down harassed and burdened by the cares incident to bringing the untrained forces of the confederacy into the field and preparing them for a struggle the seriousness of which he knew better than any one he should give his time and attention to the minute details of fitting out his youngest son as a private soldier i think it worthy of note that the son of the commanding general enlisting as a private in his army 
was not thought to be anything remarkable or unusual neither my mother my family my friends nor myself expected any other course and i do not suppose it ever occurred to my father to think of giving me an office which he could easily have done i know it never occurred to me nor did i ever hear at that time or afterwards from any one that i might have been entitled to better rank than that of a private because of my father's prominence in virginia and in the confederacy with the good advice to be obedient to all authority to do my duty in everything great or small he bade me good-bye and sent me off to the valley of virginia where the command in which i was about to enlist were serving under stonewall jackson of my father's military duties at this time colonel taylor in his four years with general lee says exercising a constant supervision over the condition of affairs at each important point thoroughly informed as to the resources and necessities of the several commanders of armies in the field as well as of the dangers which respectively threatened them he was enabled to give them wise counsel to offer them valuable suggestions and to respond to their demands for assistance and support to such extent as the limited resources of the government would permit it was in great measure due to his advice and encouragement that general magruder so stoutly and so gallantly held his lines on the peninsula against general mcclellan until troops could be sent to his relief from general johnston's army i recollect a telegraphic dispatch received by general lee from general magruder in which he stated that a council of war which he had convened had unanimously determined that his army should retreat in reply to which general lee urged him to maintain his lines and to make as bold a front as possible and encouraged him with the prospect of being early reinforced no better illustration of the nature and importance of the duty performed by general lee while in this position can be given than the following letter one of a number of similar import written by him to general jackson the rough or original draft of which is still in my possession headquarters richmond virginia april twenty ninth eighteen sixty two major general t j jackson commanding etc swift run gap virginia general i have had the honor to receive your letter of yesterday's date from the reports that reach me that are entitled to credit the force of the enemy opposite fredericksburg is represented as too large to admit of any diminution whatever of our army in that vicinity at present as it might not only invite an attack on richmond but jeopardize the safety of the army in the peninsula i regret therefore that your request to have five thousand men sent from that army to reinforce you cannot be complied with can you not draw enough from the command of general edward johnson to warrant you in attacking banks the last return received from that army show a present force of upward of thirty five hundred which it is hoped has since increased by recruits and returned furloughs as he does not appear to be pressed it is suggested that a portion of his force might be temporarily removed from its present position and made available for the movement in question a decisive and successful blow at bank's column would be fraught with the happiest results and i deeply regret my inability to send you the reinforcements you ask if however you think the combined forces of generals ewell and johnson with your own inadequate for the move general ewell might with the assistance of general anderson's army near fredericksburg strike at mcdowell's army between that city and Achaia, with much promise of success provided you feel sufficiently strong alone to hold banks in check very truly yours r e lee the reader will observe that this letter bears the date april twenty ninth eighteen sixty two on may fifth or sixth general jackson formed a junction between his own command and that of general edward johnson on may eighth he defeated milroy at mcdowell soon thereafter the command of general ewell was united to that already under jackson and on the twenty fifth of the same month banks was defeated and put to flight 
other incidents might be cited to illustrate this branch of the important service rendered at this period by general lee the line of the earthworks around the city of richmond and other preparations for resisting an attack testified to the immense care and labor bestowed upon the defense of the capital so seriously threatened by the army of general mcclellan on may thirty first the battle of seven pines was fought and general joseph e johnston commanding the confederate army was severely wounded the next day by order of the president general lee took command of the army of northern virginia the day after the battle of cold harbor during the seven days fighting around richmond was the first time i met my father after i had joined general jackson the tremendous work stonewall's men had performed including the rapid march from the valley of virginia the short rations the bad water and the great heat had begun to tell upon us and i was pretty well worn out on this particular morning my battery had not moved from its bivouac ground of the previous night but was parked in an open field already waiting orders most of the men were lying down many sleeping myself among the latter number to get some shade and to be out of the way i had crawled under a caisson and was busy making up many lost hours of rest suddenly i was rudely awakened by a comrade prodding me with a sponge staff as i had failed to be aroused by his call and was told to get up and come out that some one wished to see me half awake i staggered out and found myself face to face with general lee and his staff their fresh uniforms bright equipments and well-groomed horses contrasted so forcibly with the war-worn appearance of our command that i was completely dazed it took me a moment or two to realize what it all meant but when i saw my father's loving eyes and smile it became clear to me that he had ridden by to see if i was safe and to ask how i was getting along i remember well how curiously those with him gazed at me and i am sure that it must have struck them as very odd that such a dirty ragged unkempt youth could have been the son of this grand-looking victorious commander i was introduced recently to a gentleman now living in washington who when he found out my name said he had met me once before and that it was on this occasion at that time he was a member of the tenth virginia infantry jackson's division and was camped near our battery seeing general lee and staff approach he with others drew near to have a look at them and thus witnessed the meeting between father and son he also said that he had often told of this incident as illustrating the peculiar composition of our army after mcclellan's change of base to harrison's landing on james river the army lay inactive around richmond i had a short furlough on account of sickness and saw my father also my mother and sisters who were then living in richmond he was the same loving father to us all as kind and thoughtful of my mother who was an invalid and of us his children as if our comfort and happiness were all he had to care for his great victory did not elate him so far as one could see in a letter of july ninth to my mother he says i have returned to my old quarters and am filled with gratitude to our heavenly father for all the mercies he has extended to us our success has not been so great or complete as we could have desired but god knows what is best for us our enemy met with a heavy loss from which it must take him some time to recover before he can recommence his operations the hon alexander h stevens vice-president of the confederate states says of general lee what i had seen general lee to be at first childlike in simplicity and unselfish in his character he remained unspoiled by praise and by success he was the same in victory or defeat always calm and contained jackson having had a short rest was now moved up to gordonsville i rejoined my command and went with him supplied with new clothes and a fresh stock of health in a letter to his three daughters who were in north carolina dated richmond july eighteen eighteen sixty two he writes describing my condition rob came out to see me one afternoon he had been much worn down by his marching and fighting and had gone to his mamma to get a little rest he was thin but well but not being able to get a clean shirt has not got to see miss norval 
he has rejoined his company and gone off with general jackson as good as new again i hope inasmuch as your mother thought by means of a bath and a profusion of soap she had cleansed the outward man considerably and replenished his lost wardrobe from gordonsville we were moved on to orange county and then commenced that series of manoeuvres by the army of northern virginia beginning with the battle of cedar mountain and ending with second manassas when i again saw my father he rode at the head of longstreet's men on the field of manassas and we of jackson's corps hard pressed for two days welcomed him and the divisions which followed him with great cheers two rifle guns from our battery had been detached and sent to join longstreet's advanced artillery under general stephen d lee moving into action on our right i was number one at one of these guns we advanced rapidly from hill to hill firing as fast as we could trying to keep ahead of our gallant comrades just arrived as we were ordered to cease firing from the last position we took and the breathless cannoneers were leaning on their guns general lee and staff galloped up and from this point of vantage scanned the movements of the enemy and of our forces the general reined in traveller close by my gun not fifteen feet from me i looked at them all some few minutes and then went up and spoke to captain mason of the staff who had not the slightest idea who i was when he found me out he was greatly amused and introduced me to several others whom i already knew my appearance was even less prepossessing than when i had met my father at cold harbour for i had been marching night and day for four days with no opportunity to wash myself or my clothes my face and hands were blackened with powder sweat and the few garments i had on were ragged and stained with the red soil of that section when the general after a moment or two dropped his glass to his side he turned to his staff captain mason said general here is some one who wants to speak to you the general seeing a much begrimed artillery man sponge staff in hand said well my man what can i do for you i replied why general don't you know me and he of course at once recognized me and was very much amused at my appearance and most glad to see that i was safe and well we of the ranks used to have our opinions on all subjects the armies their generals and their manoeuvres were freely discussed if there was one point on which the entire army was unanimous i speak of the rank and file it was that we were not in the least afraid of general pope but were perfectly sure of whipping him whenever we could meet him the passages i quote here from two of general lee's letters indicate that this feeling may possibly have extended to our officers in a letter to my mother from near richmond dated july twenty eighth eighteen sixty two he says when you write to rob tell him to catch pope for me and also bring in his cousin lewis marshall who i am told is on his staff i could forgive the latter's fighting against us but not his joining pope and again johnny lee uh, footnote his nephew end note saw lewis marshall after jackson's last battle who asked him kindly after his old uncle and said his mother was well johnny said lewis looked wretched himself i am sorry he is in such bad company but i suppose he could not help it as one of the army of northern virginia i occasionally saw the commander-in-chief on the march or passed the headquarters close enough to recognize him and members of his staff but a private soldier in jackson's corps did not have much time during that campaign for visiting and until the battle of sharpsburg i had no opportunity of speaking to him on that occasion our battery had been severely handled losing many men and horses having three guns disabled we were ordered to withdraw and while moving back we passed general lee and several of his staff grouped on a little knoll near the road having no definite orders where to go our captain seeing the commanding general halted us and rode over to get some instructions some others and myself went along to see and hear general lee was dismounted with some of his staff around him a courier holding his horse captain pogue commanding our battery the rock ridge artillery saluted reported our condition and asked for instructions the general listening patiently looked at us 
his eyes passing over me without any sign of recognition and then ordered captain pogue to take the most serviceable horses and men man the uninjured gun send the disabled part of his command back to refit and report to the front for duty as pogue turned to go i went up to speak to my father when he found out who i was he congratulated me on being well and unhurt i then said general are you going to send us in again yes my son he replied with a smile you all must do what you can to help drive these people back this meeting between general lee and his son has been told very often and in many different ways but the above is what i remember of the circumstances he was much on foot during this part of the campaign and moved about either in an ambulance or on horseback with a courier leading his horse the accident which temporarily disabled him happened before he left virginia he had dismounted and was sitting on a fallen log with the bridle reins hung over his arm traveller becoming frightened at something suddenly dashed away threw him violently to the ground spraining both hands and breaking a small bone in one of them a letter written some weeks afterward to my mother alludes to this meeting with his son and to the condition of his hands i have not laid eyes on rob since i saw him in the battle of sharpsburg going in with a single gun of his for the second time after his company had been withdrawn in consequence of three of its guns having been disabled custis has seen him and says he is very well and apparently happy and content my hands are improving slowly and with my left hand i am able to dress and undress myself which is a great comfort my right is becoming of some assistance too though it is still swollen and sometimes painful the bandages have been removed i am now able to sign my name it has been six weeks to-day since i was injured and i have at last discarded the sling after the army recrossed the potomac into virginia we were camped for some time in the vicinity of winchester one beautiful afternoon in october a courier from headquarters rode up to our camp found me out and handed me a note from my father it told me of the death of my sister annie as i have lost this letter to me i quote from one to my mother about the same time it was dated october twenty sixth eighteen sixty two i cannot express the anguish i feel at the death of our sweet annie to know that i shall never see her again on earth that her place in our circle which i always hoped one day to enjoy is forever vacant is agonizing in the extreme but god in this as in all things has mingled mercy with the blow in selecting that one best prepared to leave us may you be able to join me in saying his will be done i know how much you will grieve and how much she will be mourned i wish i could give you any comfort but beyond our hope in the great mercy of god and the belief that he takes her at the time and place when it is best for her to go there is none may that same mercy be extended to us all and may we be prepared for his summons in a letter to my sister mary one month later from camp near fredericksburg the death of my dear annie was indeed to me a bitter pang but the lord gave and the lord has taken away blessed be the name of the lord in the quiet hours of the night when there is nothing to lighten the full weight of my grief i feel as if i should be overwhelmed i have always counted if god should spare me a few days after this civil war was ended that i should have her with me but year after year my hopes go out and i must be resigned to his daughter whose loss grieved him so he was specially devoted she died in north carolina at the warren white sulphur springs at the close of the war the citizens of the county erected over her grave a handsome monument general lee was invited to be present at the ceremonies of the unveiling in his reply he says i have always cherished the intention of visiting the tomb of her who never gave me aught but pleasure though absent in person my heart will be with you and my sorrow and devotions will be mingled with yours i enclose according to your request the date of my daughter's birth and the inscription proposed for the monument over her tomb the latter are the last lines of the hymn which she asked for just before her death a visitor to her grave some years after the war thus describes it in the beautiful and quiet graveyard near the springs a plain shaft of native granite marks the grave of this beloved daughter on one side is cut in the stone 
annie c lee daughter of general r e lee and mary c lee and on the opposite born at arlington june eighteenth eighteen thirty nine and died at white sulphur springs warren county north carolina october twenty eighteen sixty two on another side are the lines selected by her father perfect and true are all his ways whom heaven adores and earth obeys that autumn i was offered the position of lieutenant and a d c on the staff of my brother w h f lee just promoted from the colonelcy of the ninth virginia cavalry to the command of a brigade in the same arm of the service my father had told me when i joined the army to do my whole duty faithfully not to be rash about volunteering for any service out of my regular line and always to accept promotion after consulting him it was decided that i should take the position offered and he presented me with a horse and one of his swords my promotion necessitated my having an honourable discharge as a private from the ranks and this i obtained in the proper way from general stonewall jackson commanding the corps of which my company was a part and was thus introduced for the first time to that remarkable man having served in his command since my enlistment i had been seeing him daily old jack at a distance was as familiar to me as one of the battery guns but i had never met him and felt much awe at being ushered into his presence this feeling however was groundless for he was seemingly so much embarrassed by the interview that i really felt sorry for him before he dismissed me with my discharge papers properly made out and signed i had received a letter from my father telling me to come to him as soon as i had gotten my discharge from my company so i proceeded at once to his headquarters which were situated near orange court house on a wooded hill just east of the village i found there the horse which he gave me she was a daughter of his mare grace darling and though not so handsome as her mother she inherited many of her good qualities and carried me well until the end of the war and for thirteen years afterward she was four years old a solid bay and never failed me a single day during three years hard work the general was on the point of moving his headquarters down to fredericksburg some of the army having already gone forward to that city i think the camp was struck the day after i arrived and as the general's hands were not yet entirely well he allowed me as a great favor to ride his horse traveller among the soldiers this horse was as well known as was his master he was a handsome iron gray with black points mane and tail very dark sixteen hands high and five years old he was born near the white sulphur springs west virginia and attracted the notice of my father when he was in that part of the state in eighteen sixty one he was never known to tire and though quiet and sensible in general and afraid of nothing yet if not regularly exercised he fretted a great deal especially in a crowd of horses but there can be no better description of this famous horse than the one given by his master it was dictated to his daughter agnes at lexington virginia after the war in response to some artist who had asked for a description and was corrected in his own handwriting if i were an artist like you i would draw a true picture of traveller representing his fine proportions muscular figure deep chest and short back strong haunches flat legs small head broad forehead delicate ears quick eye small feet and black mane and tail such a picture would inspire a poet whose genius could then depict his worth and describe his endurance of toil hunger thirst heat cold and the dangers and sufferings through which he passed he could dilate upon his sagacity and affection and his invariable response to every wish of his writer he might even imagine his thoughts through the long night marches and days of battle through which he has passed but i am no artist i can only say he is a confederate gray i purchased him in the mountains of virginia in the autumn of eighteen sixty one and he has been my patient follower ever since to georgia the carolinas and back to virginia he carried me through the seven days battle around richmond the second manassas at sharpsburg fredericksburg the last day at chancellorsville to pennsylvania at gettysburg and back to the rappahannock 
from the commencement of the campaign in eighteen sixty four at orange till its close around petersburg the saddle was scarcely off his back as he passed through the fire of the wilderness spotsylvania cold harbor and across the james river he was almost in daily requisition in the winter of eighteen sixty four sixty five on the long line of defences from chickahominy north of richmond to hatcher's run south of the appomattox in the campaign of eighteen sixty five he bore me from petersburg to the final days at appomattox courthouse you must know the comfort he is to me in my present retirement he is well supplied with equipments two sets have been sent to him from england one from the ladies of baltimore and one was made for him in richmond but i think his favorite is the american saddle from st louis of all his companions in toil richmond brown roan ajax and quiet lucy long he is the only one that retained his vigor the first two expired under their onerous burden and the last two failed you can i am sure from what i have said paint his portrait the general had the strongest affection for traveller which he showed on all occasions and his allowing me to ride him on this long march was a great compliment possibly he wanted to give me a good hammering before he turned me over to the cavalry during my soldier life so far i had been on foot having backed nothing more lively than a tired artillery horse so i mounted with some misgivings though i was very proud of my steed my misgivings were fully realized for traveller would not walk a step he took a short high trot a buck trot as compared with a buck jump and kept it up to fredericksburg some thirty miles though young strong and tough i was glad when the journey ended this was my first introduction to the cavalry service i think i am safe in saying that i could have walked the distance with much less discomfort and fatigue my father having thus given me a horse and presented me with one of his swords also supplied my purse so that i could get myself an outfit suitable to my new position and he sent me on to join my command stationed not far away on the rappahannock southward from fredericksburg as an officer in the cavalry on the staff i had more frequent opportunities of seeing my father than as a private in the artillery in the course of duty i was sometimes sent to him to report the condition of affairs at the front or on the flank of the army and i also occasionally paid him a visit at these times he would take me into his tent talk to me about my mother and sisters about my horse and myself or the people and the country where my command happened to be stationed i think my presence was very grateful to him and he seemed to brighten up when i came i remember he always took it as a matter of course that i must be hungry and i was for three years so he invariably made his mess steward brian give me something to eat if i did not have time to wait for the regular meal his headquarters at this time just before the battle of fredericksburg and after were at a point on the road between fredericksburg and hamilton's crossing selected on account of its accessibility notwithstanding there was near by a good house vacant he lived in his tents his quarters were very unpretentious consisting of three or four wall tents and several more common ones they were pitched on the edge of an old pine field near a grove of forest trees from which he drew his supply of firewood while the pines helped to shelter his tents and horses from the cold winds though from the outside they were rather dismal especially through the dreary winter time within they were cheerful and the surroundings as neat and comfortable as possible under the circumstances on november twenty four eighteen sixty two in a letter to his daughter mary he writes general burnside's whole army is apparently opposite fredericksburg and stretches from the rappahannock to the potomac what his intentions are he has not yet disclosed i am sorry he is in position to oppress our friends and citizens of the northern neck he threatens to bombard fredericksburg and the noble spirit displayed by its citizens particularly the women and children has elicited my highest admiration they have been abandoning their homes night and day during all this inclement weather cheerfully and uncomplainingly with only such assistance as our wagons and ambulances could afford women girls children trudging through the mud and bivouacking in the open fields how the battle of fredericksburg was fought and won all the world has heard and i shall not attempt to describe it 
on december eleventh the day burnside commenced his attack general lee wrote to my mother the enemy after bombarding the town of fredericksburg setting fire to many houses and knocking down nearly all those along the river crossed over a large force about dark and now occupies the town we hold the hills commanding it and hope we shall be able to damage him yet his position and heavy guns command the town entirely on december sixteenth in another letter to my mother he tells of the recrossing of the federals i had supposed they were just preparing for battle and was saving our men for the conflict their hosts crown the hill and plain beyond the river and their numbers to me are unknown still i felt the confidence we could stand the shock and was anxious for the blow that is to fall on some point and was prepared to meet it here yesterday evening i had my suspicions that they might return during the night but could not believe they would relinquish their hopes after all their boasting and preparation and when i say that the latter is equal to the former you will have some idea of the magnitude this morning they were all safe on the north side of the rappahannock they went as they came in the night they suffered heavily as far as the battle went but it did not go far enough to satisfy me our loss was comparatively slight and i think will not exceed two thousand the contest will have now to be renewed but on what field i cannot say i did not see my father at any time during the fighting some days after it was all over i saw him as calm and composed as if nothing unusual had happened and he never referred to his great victory except to deplore the loss of his brave officers and soldiers or the sufferings of the sick and wounded he repeatedly referred to the hardships so bravely endured by the inhabitants of fredericksburg who had been obliged to flee from the town the women and children the old and the feeble whose sufferings cut him to the heart on christmas day he writes to his youngest daughter mildred who was at school in north carolina i cannot tell you how i long to see you when a little quiet occurs my thoughts revert to you your sisters and your mother my heart aches for our reunion your brothers i see occasionally this morning fitzhugh rode by with his young aide-de-camp rob at the head of his brigade on his way up the rappahannock you must study hard gain knowledge and learn your duty to god and your neighbor that is the great object of life i have no news confined constantly to camp and my thoughts occupied with its necessities and duties i am however happy in the knowledge that general burnside and army will not eat their promised christmas dinner in richmond to-day on the next day he writes as follows to his daughter agnes who was with her mother in richmond camp fredericksburg december twenty sixth eighteen sixty two my precious little agnes i have not heard of you for a long time i wish you were with me for always solitary i am sometimes weary and long for the reunion of my family once again but i will not speak of myself but of you i have seen the ladies in this vicinity only when flying from the enemy and it caused me acute grief to witness their exposure and suffering but a more noble spirit was never displayed anywhere the faces of old and young were wreathed with smiles and glowed with happiness at their sacrifices for the good of their country many have lost everything what the fire and shells of the enemy spared their pillagers destroyed but god will shelter them i know so much heroism will not be unregarded i can only hold oral communication with your sisters footnote his daughter mary in king george county with the lines of the enemy End note. and have forbidden the scouts to bring any writing and have taken back some that i had given them for her if caught it would compromise them they only convey messages i learn in that way she is well your devoted father r e lee i give another letter he wrote on christmas day besides the one quoted above to his daughter mildred it was written to his wife and is interesting as giving an insight into his private feelings and views regarding this great victory i will commence this holy day by writing to you my heart is filled with gratitude to almighty god for his unspeakable mercies with which he has blessed us in this day for those he has granted us from the beginning of life and particularly for those he has vouchsafed us during the past year what should have become of us without his crowning help and protection 
oh if our people would only recognize it and cease from vain self-boasting and adulation how strong would be my belief in final success and happiness to our country but what a cruel thing is war to separate and destroy families and friends and mar the purest joys and happiness god has granted us in this world to fill our hearts with hatred instead of love for our neighbours and to devastate the fair face of this beautiful world i pray that on this day when only peace and good will are preached to mankind better thoughts may fill the hearts of our enemies and turn them to peace our army was never in such good health and condition since i have been attached to it i believe they share with me my disappointment that the enemy did not renew the combat on the thirteenth i was holding back all day and husbanding our strength and ammunition for the great struggle for which i thought i was preparing had i divined that was to have been his only effort he would have had more of it my heart bleeds at the death of every one of our gallant men one marked characteristic of my father was his habit of attending to all business matters promptly he was never idle and what he had to do he performed with care and precision mr custis my grandfather had made him executor of his will wherein it was directed that all the slaves belonging to the estate should be set free after the expiration of so many years the time had now arrived and notwithstanding the exacting duties of his position the care of his suffering soldiers and his anxiety about their future immediate and distant he proceeded according to the law of the land to carry out the provisions of the will and had delivered to every one of the servants where it was possible their manumission papers from his letters written at this time i give a few extracts bearing on this subject as regards the liberation of the people i wish to progress in it as far as i can those hired in richmond can still find employment there if they choose those in the country can do the same or remain on the farms i hope they will all do well and behave themselves i should like if i could to attend to their wants and see them placed to the best advantage but that is impossible all that choose can leave the state before the war closes i executed the deed of manumission sent me by mr caskey and returned it to him i perceived that john sawyer and james's names among the arlington people had been omitted and i inserted them i fear there are others among the white house lot which i did not discover as to the attacks of the northern papers i do not mind them and do not think it wise to make the publication you suggest if all the names of the people at arlington and on the pamunkey are not embraced in this deed i have executed i should like a supplementary deed to be drawn up containing all those omitted they are entitled to their freedom and i wish to give it to them those that have been carried away i hope are free and happy i cannot get their papers to them and they do not require them i will give them if they ever call for them it will be useless to ask their restitution to manumit them End of chapter four